Um, thanks, Ms. Uh, Mr. Deputy President. Um, it's with no great pleasure that I rise tonight to speak on this bill and have my um, uh, contribution to those of uh, our spokesperson, Senator Penny Wright, um, who I want to acknowledge and congratulate um, her and her staff for pulling together um, a remarkable dissenting report given the extraordinary time pressure that the crossbenchers, opposition senators, committee staff and most particularly witnesses, uh, expert witnesses who are brought together to assess this bill um, that the government proposes to shotgun through this place. And I don't use that term lightly, but when you look at the process by which um, this government uh, is putting this bill forward, and I want to just very quickly sketch um, what has led us to this sorry place that we're in today with this bill. The second in, I would say, a series of two national security bills, although the government um, is proposing that a metadata retention bill be included in that. I don't include that in a set of three because I think it's only tangentially related to national security, but this one does. I'll say at the outset um, that the general premise of the government being concerned about people returning from conflicts overseas, potentially having uh, come into contact with extreme ideologies or being steeped in those ideologies, potentially coming, uh, in, uh, coming home, I should say, with post-traumatic stress disorder, after having been involved in goodness knows what kind of um, violent conflicts, I think there is an issue there, and that's been acknowledged across the spectrum. What I do question is whether this bill makes any substantive or meaningful contribution towards protecting people um, from, from foreign fighters. It is not to, um, to say that the issue doesn't exist, but it has, of course, existed for years. And I'd be interested to know, um, for example, whether the government has given any thought to combatants on both sides who might have travelled to uh, Gaza during Israel's recent bombardment there, or whether somehow uh, they are not to be considered within the scope of this legislation. This bill was, uh, would normally uh, have been submitted to the Senate Standing Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which my colleague Senator Wright chairs. Uh, the Legislation Committee, which Senator Ian Macdonald chairs, decided not to assess the bill, and it was instead uh, sent to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which the government, after it came to power last September, eliminated the crossbench spot. Senator Faulkner made some comments uh, in that regard not too long ago. It is a committee that excludes the crossbench, who make up a uh, representation of 18 the largest ever representation in this chamber, not just the Greens, people from right across the political spectrum and right across the country, are basically blocked from assessing the bill, from talking to expert witnesses, uh, and then it's brought back in here as a fait accompli with a set of amendments uh, agreed to by the opposition, as Senator Conroy has just outlined. So not, no crossbench involvement, no involvement of the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, a very, very rapid process which nearly all of the witnesses who did manage to pull high-quality submissions together acknowledged, too fast to properly evaluate. Um, the National Security Legislation Monitor, as Senator Wright acknowledged um, in her contribution, has been vacant since April. That's the office that is meant to assess whether counterterrorism legislation is necessary and proportionate. That's the measure with which the government regards or holds the, the former or potential future uh, office of the monitor um, in, in obviously contempt, in very, very low regard. Because the government has ignored a substantive amount of the recommendations um, that Mr Walker SC made in, in the last series of reports that he tabled on issues of direct relevance to the bill, and you haven't even bothered, through you, Deputy President, to reappoint the office. You've been happy to leave that live vacant. Since April, Senator Brandis is always proud to come in here and say that it was one of his colleagues, Senator Judith Troth, who brought that bill forward. It's a private senator's bill that I co-sponsored and brought through here. It didn't pass for well over a year, but nonetheless, the office existed until April, when the government thought it could wipe it out because of how little it cares about oversight and accountability, and has since left the office vacant since April. It's disgusting. Um, and of course, the IGES, uh, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, deals only with the aftermath, deals with issues at the end of the pipe, does not really have a policy evaluation role about whether laws like this are necessary or proportionate. And so uh, that's where we've been left. And my understanding is maybe um, the minister at the table can correct me if this is incorrect that at about half past 12 tomorrow, there'll be a gag motion moved and this debate will be shut down. 
That is treating this chamber with contempt and the role that we are sent here to try. Whether you support the bill or not, or not whether you propose amendments or not, um, this process of simply shotgunning legislation as dangerous as this through this place um, is absolutely appalling. Why exactly is the government in such a hurry? Yes, I agree that there is a legitimate public policy issue with combatants returning from violent conflicts overseas. Australians have been transiting in and out of Syria through the gruesome civil war there in Syria for three or four years that we know of. Why the sudden urgency uh, over the last couple of weeks? People can draw their own conclusions. And of course, the opposition um, has simply given this bill a free pass as they did with the ASIO bill. We saw this remarkable outpouring of regret from people as diverse as, as uh, Shadow, spokes, uh, Shadow Minister Albanese, I guess speaking in a private capacity, uh, Greg Sheridan from The Australian, Janet Albrechtson, as well as an entire spectrum of commentators uh, around civil rights, civil society, industry, after the bill had passed, expressing that regret. And I wonder whether we're going to see a similar performance from Labor spokesperson on this bill. And it is once again left to the crossbenchers to provide the opposition in this country. I don't know what Senator Lambie is going to have to say. Won't speak for the other crossbenchers, but it appears to be the last place in this chamber where critical thought on bills like this reside. Mr. Anthony Byrne, who's uh, chaired the PJCIS, the Joint Committee, um, last year, and someone who I hold in quite high regard. Um, I, I think he's the deputy chair of it now, made some really perceptive comments a couple of months ago about counterterrorism legislation. It was before uh, ISIS really got a grip on uh, Western Iraq, although obviously it had been festering in Syria for a long period of time. Mr Byrne made the comment uh, in, an, in an interview, it's best that we have these uh, debates around legislation as, as fraught as this uh, in the light of day without some kind of pressure, without uh, having to operate in the context of, of some kind of um, security emergency or heightened state of alarm, it's best that we actually hold these debates in a more measured way than that. Uh, and I think he's actually quite correct. But of course what he left out is that the reason that he presumably felt to move that is that he knew that the Labor Party wouldn't be able to withstand the onslaught and would cave in. And that's why it's best to be having these conversations in a more measured way. And of course we're not. Uh, by this time tomorrow, this bill will have been sent back to the House and will be on its way to being in, in law. Again, it is left to the crossbenchers to provide that critical thought. What we see um, on my analysis, really, and on, on the, um, the detailed and extremely valuable dissenting report um, that Senator Penny Wright has put forward, is a mashup of different clauses, some measures that are sensible and necessary, some measures that are redundant because there are already provisions in criminal law that cover those offences. And it makes it look much more as though somebody just wanted to draft some laws to look as though we're doing something. Be able to call a press conference and say we're going to pass some new laws. Actually, many of the things in this bill are redundant because uh, offences exist and have existed for long periods of time for the kind of incitements to violence and criminal conspiracy that this bill, um, for some reason, thinks it's making an improvement on. And thirdly, measures that are simply dangerous and should not be in Australian law. Um, those obviously including um, the, uh, the measures that Mr Walker SC believed should be taken off the statute books and not be given those additional sunset clauses. Um, the Greens recommend that the bill not be passed in its current form. And I think it's a great tragedy that the bill, uh, the committee stage debate where we actually get to have a reasoned discussion and debate about amendments is likely to be cut short tomorrow um, by this gag motion that the government seems to be intending to move. Preventative detention orders should be removed from the criminal code. Control orders should be amended in line with recommendations by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. Again, somebody who Senator Brander seems to hold in high esteem, uh, esteem except that he wanted to abolish the office and hasn't bothered to reappoint another one. At least have the grace to read the reports that the guy produced since that was his primary mandate, is to accept, uh, assess precisely these kind of clauses and work out whether they're necessary and proportionate. We will also be opposing the schedules of the bill that seek to expand the collection, the use and the sharing of biometric material in airport passenger processing systems. This is one of the most troubling aspects of the bill. This goes to Schedule 5, the use of automated border processing control systems to identify 
particular individuals in immigration clearance, um, but actually pass um, quite substantive um, automatic surveillance technologies across the entire travelling population. And those proposed in Schedule 6, as the, um, as the dissenting report points out, seek to extend the use of biometric material as part of the advanced passenger processing system. And this can impact on the privacy of a vast number of people who are suspected of nothing at all. And that is why uh, I think the Privacy Commissioner told the Parliamentary Joint Commission, uh, Committee on Intelligence and Security that a privacy impact assessment should be undertaken. Nothing in sight. The, the government doesn't appear to be interested in, in that at all. The Commissioner said such an assessment could be done in a way to help inform the bill to see whether any additional safeguards need to be built into the legislative base to add additional protections to that information. And isn't it extraordinary that the minister uh, representing in this capacity was still tabling explanatory memoranda to a bill that is still under development, apparently, even though we've been debating it in here for several hours? That is the kind of debacle that you walk into when you bring uh, a bill through here with such a rush. Um, nearly everybody who made a submission to this bill acknowledged that it was being done much, much too quickly. We haven't heard from any coalition spokesperson thus far um, the case for this extraordinary haste. The Privacy Commissioner um, emphasised the following, and I'll quote, the importance of ensuring that any expansion of existing powers accords with community expectations about the handling of personal information. This balance can be achieved by ensuring that where the handling of an individual's personal information is authorised in the broader interests of the community, including upholding national security, those activities are accompanied by an appropriate level of privacy safeguards and accountability. And I'm sure that the Labor Party believe um, that that accountability has been baked into this bill, and we respectfully, strongly disagree. I want to draw the Chamber's attention to a joint statement on this legislation. Um, the Foreign Fighters Bill, um, titled Don't Rush Through Unnecessary Counter-Terror Laws That Erode Democratic Rights and Freedoms, um, countersigned by 43 separate organisations. They make the case um, that the government denies our elected representatives and the community the opportunity to fully debate the proposed changes, so again, making that case for this extreme urgency that's been pressed. And they make, I think, a profoundly important point. And I'll just read briefly from, from the beginning of the statement. The Australian government has an important duty to protect the community from terrorism. At times, laws can legitimately limit the rights of individuals for the purpose of countering this threat, provided the limitations are necessary and proportionate. In fact, national security laws and the protection of human rights share complementary goals. Both are concerned with protecting Australians from harm. And this false dichotomy that gets put to us from the Prime Minister's office on down, that actually we need to give up some of our rights in order to increase security, is exposed here, I think, quite elegantly in this statement as a false dichotomy. National security laws and the protection of human rights share complementary goals. Both are concerned with protecting Australians from harm. You don't increase one by obliterating the other, and yet that is precisely what this bill does. The idea that agents or police can enter your home or enter the home of somebody or the premise of somebody who's not actually suspected of any offence and not even have to uh, um, notify anybody that that has occurred until months afterwards is characteristic of a police state. Preventative detention is characteristic of a police state. These are very, very dangerous powers that we play around with here. And once they're on the statute books, as Mr Walker quite correctly point out, they are inordinately difficult to get rid of. And that is why the Greens believe, firstly, that the bill should not pass in the current form, and secondly, that the government, perhaps with the support of the opposition, I don't know, should rethink the unnecessary haste with which this legislation is being bashed through the parliament. Because the one thing that we don't want to see is a repeat of what happened after the ASIO bill, where it was passed uh, late at night in uh, extraordinary haste, and then the editorial pages on the following few days and the TV shows and the op-ed opinion pieces that came out said, what the hell have we done? How did we let this happen? Why was this done? What we are hoping for is that kind of critical thinking and analysis before the bill passes, not after. And we do put the government on notice that their so-called third tranche of legislation, which I think actually, as I said before, is only peripherally related to national security, 
uh, because it is in fact a multitude of other agencies who are accessing metadata on a warrantless basis, not really a national security bill at all, that that again is a line that we call on the Labor Party to just step back from and start behaving like a party of opposition. Thank the Chamber.